27 different countries covering pretty much every continent uh, except Antarctica, which um, unless we know someone in <laughs> who will be from the base camps there, I think it's unlikely to get a, a registrant from there. Um, so welcome to everyone for joining. Uh, hopefully this will be an enjoyable session. The structure of today's session is really to give context and, and a grounding to what this competition is about um, and why pets are, are of interest and importance in the context of uh, the United Nations and, and uh, national statistics offices around the world. Uh, the structure for today is uh, we'll be passing it over to Ronald Johnson, um, who's the chair of the UN Pet Lab, but he has more titles than I can uh, <laughs> I, I can name. So um, he's he's really been a, a kind of a pioneer in pulling all of this work that, that, that's that been going on, these activities around privacy enhancing technologies in at the uh, kind of statistical commission context together. Um, so he'll give us a brief overview and then we'll pass over to Federico Sanson, who's coming from the UNHCR. So that's the part of the United Nations that deals with um, refugees and people of concern from around the world. And he'll talk a little bit about his job and, and what they actually do on that team and how you know, data disclosure controls and privacy is such a key part of that. And um, from there, we've got uh, Nisha Holland, who will be joining us from uh, IBM Research uh, Europe, who will give an overview of what goes wrong when we don't manage our, our privacy controls in a, in a structured way, let's say. Um, and followed by that, we have Rob Sarsik who will give a broad overview and kind of categorization of the pets landscape. And finally, one of the important topics that's a, a major feature of the competition um, is also around differential privacy. And we want to have a bit of an understanding from that. And fortunately, we have James Honecker, who's um, the Chief Privacy Officer of OpenDP um, and has worked in, in the space of privacy, really been a pioneer of that over the last you know, decades. So um, it should be a good lineup. And at the, the end of it all, hopefully the, the uh, competition itself will seem to make a bit more sense. And then the webinar this day, same time next week, will actually go over the libraries, the scoring, the mechanics of the competition itself. So you know how to be engaged throughout the, the competition that's running once again from the 8th to the 11th of November. So from there, I'll leave it to you, Ronald, to take over. Um, and yeah, welcome to everyone in participating in hopefully this exciting new competition. Thank you, Jack. And uh, yes, good day to everyone. Um, I'm uh, Ronald Jansen. I'm with the uh, United Nations uh, Statistics Division in New York. Uh, so it's still morning here, but uh, I'm sure we have people from all around the world. So, so thank you for connecting. Um, I would like to uh, spend spend a few minutes to uh, to give a little bit of context to uh, to where this this hackathon fits uh, in in the overall picture. Um, so the 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 UN uh, Pet Lab, so the Privacy Enhancing Technologies Lab, um, is uh, part of the. Um, the United Nations Committee of Experts on Big Data and Data Science for Official Statistics. Um, the community my office works for is the community of national statistical offices. So you have Census Bureau in the US, that's Canada, you have uh, Statistics Netherlands, but also uh, the broader picture. We have uh, statistical offices in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, uh, all part of, the, of this family uh, of, um, of statistical institutes uh, working for uh, for official statistics. Uh, they come together every year uh, in the uh, Statistical Commission. Uh, that's uh, usually around March uh, at the United Nations uh, to discuss um, uh, all topics on official statistics, uh, basically uh, deciding, agreeing together uh, what um, our methods, uh, recommendations, international recommendations are on, on, on many topics, so whether it is population or or, or economics or environmental uh, that be, be discussed, um, but also then in the area of, uh, of innovation. Um, innovation can be a use, use of big data. A lot of it is also uh, getting access um, to, uh, to new data sources, getting access like to, to the use of mobile phone data, 
uh, to the use of, of other data that are uh, that are sensitive. And that's where privacy enhancing technologies uh, uh, can help us a lot. Um, also, um, uh, statistical institutes do um, collect uh, microdata or they compile microdata and want to make it uh, available to the research in in institute or to research community or to, to other communities. And also at that end, uh, we, we, uh, we need to make sure that we have uh, uh, a privacy uh, uh, enhancing technologies, uh, which, which can make it can can make it so that those data can be used uh, by others without um, a while protecting uh, privacy without violating any any privacy of the sensitive data that uh, that we have um, so that is the context of um, uh, of of the, of the hackathon a specific context is also the um, the conference that we are having in in indonesia the conference uh, of this uh, 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 committee of experts on big data and data science for official statistics. Uh, the conference uh, will take place in person uh, from 7 to 11 November in Yogyakarta, Indonesia. Uh, on the opening day, um, we will have uh, there um, uh, some high level officials from Indonesia uh, and from the UN. Uh, the first day will really be a connection to um, uh, to those who are using, uh, uh, I mean, who are using um, data for policy making, we will try to uh, connect with um, the political agendas regarding global uh, challenges um, like uh, food security, like uh, economic recovery, um, and we want to stress the point that um, from our community's perspective, so access to relevant data uh, is really important. Um, I hope you've seen the, uh, the, the website. Um, so within that conference, we have uh, um, a few hackathons and in, in and one of the hackathons is this uh, hackathon on the use of, of pets. Uh, as an example of access to relevant data, we will have uh, uh, the uh, access, uh, we, we will discuss um, the um, uh, data from the uh, uh, on refugees from the uh, UNHCR, and Federico will uh, will talk about that in a little bit. Um, but uh, I, I think what the, the importance is also for us on this competition is to show that um, uh, that privacy enhancing technologies work, uh, that they can be used, and that for the future of of our community, uh, it will be very important that we have trustworthy pets that can be used by statistical officers to get access for the statistical officers to sensitive data and also for the statistical officers to be able to disseminate uh, data uh, to the society and researchers uh, in a safe way. So with that, I'll uh, I'll give back, uh, Jack, to you. Uh, and I uh, really wish everyone a, a great competition. Uh, I hope you can see the broader picture. Uh, this is something that, that is relevant and, uh, and I hope that you really contribute and compete here. Jack, back to you. Thanks so much, Ronald. So, you know, I think I think we hopefully have set some of the stage for why you know pri privacy as a topic is is important and relevant, obviously within the context of um, of the United Nations and all of the national statistics communities around the world. But I always found that the real value is when you talk to someone who's actually worked on these challenges themselves. And you kind of hear from their perspective the challenges that they have and, and, and why it's important to their role. So we're very happy to have Federico Sanson, who's a regional data curator with the Global Data Services team as part of UNHCR, to speak to us now and tell us a little bit about yeah, their work and their challenges and, and, how, and why they exist even as a team in the first place. So I'll pass it over to Federico and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Jack. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Federico from UNICEAR. We are the UN Refugee Agency and I'm part uh, of the data curation team, which basically we are in charge of managing the data sets worldwide and make them available both internally and externally with all the challenges that this brings. Um, we are arguably the leader of uh, refugee data. We make uh, many data collections, many services every year, hundreds of them. 
So the challenge is to find, uh, manage all these data sets and make them available. So I will share a short presentation. It probably will help to understand the better what we do. Okay. So this is a process. Um, our team uh, is not that old. So we started doing the actual curation since 2019. Of course, there was already some data curation, but it was not that uh, standardized. OK, so we improved these uh, aspects. And the whole idea is uh, also in collaboration with other organizations to work uh, on managing the data, make it available, make it safe, uh, and uh, we are working towards open data. And we're working on technologies uh, to make this available. For the reason pets are very, very interesting to us, uh, we are working on them, we are exploring these technologies, and we keep uh, studying them. So this is Competition is a big opportunity for us to test uh, these uh, technologies and to show that they are very useful for the purpose of open data. So before we did this data curation in a very standardized way, we had many data collections, but there were few challenges, few problems. First of all, the storage was not as systematic. So we have some tools for the data collection, in particular Kobo, if you're aware of it. But what happened is that we had many data collections. These data collection are, were managed at local level. So each operation, each country did their own data collection. They used the data collection for the purpose of the data collection. So they did one analysis. So they most of the time they used just once the data and then the data was not used anymore. And so there was some issues with both uh, uh, the visibility of what data was available internally. So it was not so evident uh, what data was available around the world. And also it was not that easy to share the data. Uh, before we had uh, to share the data and create each time uh, a custom ad hoc agreement, which took a lot of time uh, and created uh, many issues, also because this was managed at local level. So there were many doubts, uh, and uh, this was a big challenge to make it available both internally and externally. For this reason, we share, we used to share the data externally, but much less than now. And we did it only with main, uh, the main organizations like the World Bank, all the UN agencies, few universities, but it was very difficult to share it with many, many people, many researchers, many statistical offices, etc. The other issue was a lack of standardization in the documentation. So the lack uh, of information metadata for each data set. Currently, we use the DDI standard. So it's also easier to understand uh, uh, the data set, the content of the data set, et cetera. Okay. So why we want to share this data? What's the potential is that uh, large uh, scale analysis will be possible. So we could combine different data sets to make large uh, analysis. We can create uh, indicators, baselines, etc., uh, better models for forecasting. Also, we have the opportunity to compare between uh, uh, camps, regions, countries, different indicators, also to compare to have uh, uh, year over year to see the same kind of, of data collection uh, during the time, how it evolves, et cetera, et cetera. So we are working hard in this uh, direction. We have data transformation strategy. 
basically the main reason we have it is to make it as much as possible available, open data, but uh, this uh, uh, sharing data, both internally and externally, of course, brings many challenges. And the main issue that we always take into account uh, is to find the right balance between uh, what we call uh, privacy protection and the benefits to utility of the data. So, of course, uh, if you don't share anything, uh, your data is going to be very protected, but at the same time, uh, we lose a lot uh, of utility or the opportunities that we are going to have uh, uh, of the data. On the other side, uh, we have to make sure that the data is safe. Uh, That's why we are exploring new technology and the pets are very interesting. And also take into account uh, that uh, uh, UNICER, the refugee data, is quite sensitive itself. First of all, well, there is the privacy in general, which refugee, but also the refugees is more vulnerable people. So we have to pay very uh, strict attention to these aspects. Also because there are, uh, the refugee may be in danger for some particular reasons, in particular, particular reasons, or maybe because they belong to a minority. And this may be the reason they prove for which they had to flood their country. So we had to be very careful to take into account also uh, the sensitivity that could be specific of a certain uh, community or certain country only. Regarding our team, uh, we have, uh, I would say, we have HQ in Denmark, in Copenhagen, where we provide support worldwide, and then we have uh, uh, data curators around the world with the idea to provide support to each region. Uh, personally, I am Bogota currently in Colombia. And just to give you an idea of the challenges uh, that we have uh, as well as a, an organization, we have uh, we are a very complex organization, very big, but also very decentralized organization where most of the work happens in the field. So the data collection happens in the field, uh, is managed directly by each uh, operation, by each country. And also, uh, what's interesting is that the ownership of uh, the data belongs to the operation. So when, when we want to share the data, we want to work on the data, create the data, we need always the green light approval of the operation of each country. So. Uh, this brings many challenges because when we prepare the data, we need to discuss uh, uh, with each operation. And this is also where the PETS technology are interesting because the more we streamline the process of sharing data, the more it's standardized, the easier and faster it gets to get uh, the data outside and share uh, this kind of information. Currently, uh, the curation process works like this. Uh, we work with operations to get uh, the data. So it's the acquisition. We do some checks on the quality and eventually some cleaning. Then there is the part of the minimization that we'll discuss soon. So we prepare the data for sharing. And then we have the documentation, the data. Currently, as I say, we follow the data documentation initiative, the DDI. So to make sure that data can be understood uh, and it's easier to work with it. So now let's talk about the anonymization. This is the current process that we have, which uh, uh, is slightly different. It has quite a bit difference with the kind of data sharing we are going to work in the hackathon because the hackathon we're going to use uh, mostly that differential privacy while currently in CR we are using that anonymization using statistical disclosure control methods they are different uh, technologies i would say with pros and cons uh, but we also explain why uh, differential privacy can be very, very interesting, very useful, and provide solution to the limitation of the SDC methods. 
for the current anonymization, the process works like this. Uh, first of all, uh, we have uh, a process with data provider for each country to discuss the particular uh, characteristic of the data set. So the process is standardized, but still requires uh, quite a bit of discussion with uh, the operation because each data set has uh, its own characteristics. We have to take into account also the characteristics of the country. So we assess the risk and we have to notify the variables that could be used to identify somebody in the data set. Then we work to reduce the, the, the risk that includes many different methods. And these methods modify the data set. OK, so we modify the data set and we will share the macro data data set. Uh, this modify in respect of the original one. And that's why differential privacy is quite interesting because differential privacy works on the original data set mostly. It gives you the opportunity to work on the original data set. It adds noise afterwards, so uh, it can provide uh, better results and also in some for some data set, how we explain later, uh, can be a game changer. And that's why we are exploring these technologies. And finally, we measure utility just to make sure that the modified data set will provide uh, similar results once you do an analysis. And that's it. So just to give you the, the whole data management process, as it is now, we start with the design of the survey. We do the collection of the data at the uh, local level. We store the data, and then there is uh, the part uh, of creation. So we do the categorization, we do some cleaning, we analyze the data eventually, and we do the anonymization, and then we disseminate. Uh, this data set, they get anonymized. Currently, we have a macro data library that we launched a few years ago. And I'm going to show you. So it is available at macrodata.umcr.org. So I invite you to go and give a look. We have uh, already many data sets available of refugee, internally displaced people, other people concerned. It is an external facing library with macrodata that's being anonymized. Um, most data sets are available under license, so you have to request the data and agree on the on not uh, using the data for other purposes, the analysis. So the data is given, uh, the actual data set has been modified uh, under license. We like the idea of uh, pets and differential privacy because it could uh, give a higher level of protection because we provide the data set as synthetic data or through differential privacy, so not directly the data set. While currently we provide an anonymized data set, so we provide an actual data set that can be downloaded and analyzed. Anyway, I invite you to go on the website and give a look and see if there is anything that can be interesting and if we can collaborate. Currently, we are we have uh, more than 500 data sets available. Uh, even if we started uh, just a few years ago, uh, you can see by region how many data sets we have. Uh, <clears throat> here is interesting to note uh, uh, Europe. We used to have uh, around zero data sets for Europe, but now. Unfortunately, we say it's growing, as you know, for the situation in Ukraine. So this is just to give you an idea that uh, we work hard to make available data set as soon as possible, even if it's not always uh, that easy, because the process currently takes some time. And there's also why pets can be interesting because it could streamline the process even more. And for example, uh, we have many data set on COVID. That was the main topic for the past two years. So we, we always try to make available data sets that are interesting uh, currently. They are the main topics. So we work hard in this sense. And that you can see also the main topics that we have. So to give you an idea of the data we work on on UCR. 
So more, uh, the main category is socioeconomic livelihoods. Then we have uh, generic multi-sector assessments, uh, health and nutrition, uh, uh, particularly interesting for Africa, where also we check uh, uh, particularly important for children to see if they are growing for the nutrition enough, etc. Then we have protection uh, data sets uh, to see if there are protection needs, how we can address them. Another big category is the wash sanitation. The wash is water sanitation hygiene. So if they have access to uh, water facilities, if they have knowledge about hygiene, etc., etc., then we do a lot of cash assistance and we have after each cash assistance, uh, a post distribution monitoring to see the effects of this assistance. And then we have uh, other data sets. But anyway, each, since each operation uh, working its own, they do have uh, uh, their own, uh, their free, some freedom about the kind of survey. We have many ad hoc surveys for specific topics. For example, since COVID was very important in the past two years. We have now many data sets uh, about COVID uh, or in many data sets, we included a section about COVID to have some information about the vaccinations, if they knew refugees have knowledge about uh, the symptoms of COVID, et cetera, et cetera. Just to give you an idea about the usage, uh, this is not really up to date, but it gives you an idea that we started in the last few years, but the number of users that are using uh, our library is growing exponentially. So this gives an idea of the great interest uh, that there is for this kind of information, this kind of data. So we really want to make this kind of data as much as possible available externally because we can see big value in make uh, this data available. We already have uh, many researchers that published uh, some papers using our data, so we can see this very useful and we can collaborate together. And then just to give you an idea on the kind of institution they are requesting the data. Uh, it's interesting that many comes from university. This is interesting because as I explained before, we had to do some uh, uh, agreement, ad hoc agreement every time. So it was not really easy to share the data with every person, every researcher that wanted the data. So using this kind of technology, and we hope with pets to make it even more easy, it's easier to uh, share with the data with more people, with more institution even the smaller one with PhD candidates, with national statistic offices. So we see this number of, uh, of data set that we share uh, getting bigger and bigger, and we can share also with smaller organizations, and et cetera, et cetera. So to summarize uh, everything, the challenges and the opportunities that PETS technology can give us is first of all, uh, we can see that pets can give us, help us in streamlining the process. So we have uh, hundreds of new data sets each year, and we have to work on them, discuss with which uh, operation, which country, how to prepare them, et cetera, et cetera. So the more uh, scalable is the process, the more streamlined, the easier is to timely share the data set. So pets, can be very useful in this direction, especially differential privacy. We can see it as more scalable technology. Then uh, we can offer higher quality uh, of the data or analysis because for some kind of data set, we can see as pets as a better uh, opportunity. Uh, I showed before the kind of data set that we have. There is one important kind of data set this is not yet available in the microdata library, this registration data. Registration data is basically a census. The idea is to have a census of all uh, uh, refugees in the world uh, for each uh, country. Uh, the data itself is mostly the demographics. 
but it is very important because it contains the data of each uh, uh, refugee while all the, the other data sets are mostly surveys uh, done by sample. So this kind of data set is challenging to share it because it's a census and in general it's, it's challenging to share a data set where the sample is big compared to the population. And the event, uh, if you want to share it using the current technology that we use, uh, we will need to do a, a sample of this data set or this census. So we will have to do like a sample 5% or even less. With differential privacy or the pets, we can see the opportunity of providing a, a higher uh, level of precision of uh, of the data because probably we will not need uh, to modify the data especially we not need to sample the data but we could provide uh, statistics based on the original data sets and finally we can see also the opportunity through pets uh, to provide more protection because we will not need to share the actual data set we, we could use differential privacy or we could provide uh, a synthetic data data set so on my side, I think it's all. If there is any question, uh, they're welcome. I just leave here the, the link to the Microdata library. Again, also our email, microdata.uncr.org. So don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Thanks. Thanks very much, Frederico. I, I think one of the things that really stuck out for me when I, I first like started to hear about the work that you guys do as well is kind of the sheer importance of it because you know often you, you know people talk and hear about refugees all the time, but they actually really are some of the most like vulnerable people in our broader society. Usually they're leaving for a very real and prominent reason. So I think the, the work that you guys do is is incredibly important because it's fundamental to protecting so many people's identity and privacy, which is fundamentally important to them. While at the same time, as an organization, yeah, there's kind of a continued need to in, improve your ability to do data driven insights and to share information with, you know, uh, academia, uh, governments, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to support uh, often in very short time periods, you know, uh, developments in, in the area. So. That's fantastic. I'm sure there will be a number. I can already see that there's some questions coming in, but if it's OK, we'll pile them into the kind of Q&A section at the end and then we can kind of discuss uh, further at that point. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Great. So the next speaker um, is a, a fellow Irishman, um, Nisha Hallam, and um, he's the differential privacy kind of um, lead researcher in I IBM Europe and uh, this is his PhD in in differential privacy um, and no better man to, to tell us what goes wrong when we don't have you know, structured controls in place um, to, to, to track and maintain what information we're actually releasing and disclosing when we share data sets etc. So over to you Nisha, thanks very much. Uh, hi Jack, thank you very much. I um, just want to double check that you can see my screen before I uh, start speaking. Um, it's a very yeah. wet and windy and stormy Ireland at the moment. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. So as Jack was saying, uh, my name is Nisha Hulahan. I work in the privacy and security of AI team uh, in IBM Research in Dublin, here in Ireland. And I just want to give a, a quick kind of, I guess, a precursor to um, to Rob and James speaking about differential privacy, which forms quite a, I guess, a prominent role in this uh, hackathon and talking about the pitfalls of when anonymization and when data privacy goes wrong. And I guess in some respects, um, when the technologies or older technologies uh, give a false sense of security of the of their strength. Um, so I'm going to start with a quick overview of what I term traditional anonymization. And these are typically deterministic tools that we use to 
remove sensitive or sensitivities in a data set that we want to publish or pass on to um, external parties, for example. Um, so suppression and generalization where you uh, remove entire rows or columns from a data set and rather generalization when you, um, as it says, generalize this. So for example, generalizing a value to a, a range or um, if you have a hierarchy of values, for example, city to country to continent. Um, masking and tokenization are also very important. Masking is where you replace a, a value with a, a fictional or a randomized one and tokenization when we um, replace a sensitive value with a, uh, a unique identifier that we can still use to group transactions and things like that together. And then in the late 90s, the idea of K-anonymity was first conceived where you use generalization and suppression and these kind of tools to preserve privacy. And there's an example here, so I think it's always good to, to work with an example. So in this example, we've got two quasi-identifiers where a quasi-identifier you can um, link together to a uniquely identify a record. And then we've got a sensitive attribute disease that we're going to preserve because that's kind of the value that we have in this data set. And we're going to generalize or suppress our age and sex to make sure that each combination of those in the anonymous data set appears at least K times. And for this K equals two. So you can see in this uh, colorful data set here, we have, uh, it's a two anonymous data set where each combination of age and sex appears at least twice. But the problem here is, um, if you know that we have a 23 year old female in this data set, then you automatically know that this person has HIV. Um, so in this instance, K-anonymity hasn't really done a good job of preserving privacy of the individual. That's example number one. Um, another example then is uh, here is when tokenization fails to, to achieve privacy. So in this example, we have a list of credit card transactions with various information about the location, the amount and the date and time. And we're going to uh, anonymize in quotation marks by replacing the credit card number with a tokenization uh, uh, or tokenized value. Now this means if we had to have the credit card number or we know someone's credit card number, then we can't automatically go into the data set and find out what their transactions were over the last month. However, if we do have uh, if you manage to find a, a credit card receipt or something like that, then we can use that to zone in on it on that transaction in the data set. Then we can uncover the tokenized credit card number and expose all of the transactions that have been um, associated with that card. Now you might say in this example, okay, what about if we uh, change the amounts or um, uh, generalize them to the, the largest whole number and do the same with the date and time. So remove the minutes or even the hours of the transaction, then you can say, okay, this attack wouldn't work. Um, in that case, you're correct, but um, research has shown that doing those kind of generalizations uh, limit the utility of the data, but doesn't give you great protection because if you have a, a second credit card receipt, for example, the uniqueness of those two uh, transactions will be enough to, um, or could be enough to, to, do, to run this attack again. And I'm gonna end then with, I guess, three more famous examples of, um, of de-anonymization or anonymization gone wrong and attacked um, in the wild and in, in reality. Um, so, the first of those examples is the Netflix prize case, which I'm sure the vast majority of people on this call will be familiar with, but I'll do a quick overview of it all the same. Um, so back in 2006, Netflix published a anonymized data set of um, movie ratings in order to, for researchers to improve the recommender system and they had a cash prize for the, for the best solution. And researchers were able to link it with the publicly available IMDB and basically uncover individuals in the Netflix data set. And you might think, okay, well, what, what's the big uh, deal with that? Um, but if you could imagine that uh, you're probably giving uh, movie, rate, movie ratings to Netflix in confidence, knowing that they're going to keep that data private, um, you might be a lot more willing to give uh, ratings to sensitive movies that you might be watching. And it's this kind of an attack then that linking you with a public data set out there in the wild and exposing the sensitive information that you've given in confidence to Netflix. And this caused a lot of controversy within Netflix 
um, and culminated in a second iteration of the, of the competition of the Netflix prize being canceled. Um, AOL uh, published a data set of anonymized internet search logs. And this is an interesting case because it's not actually an external data linkage attack that was conducted, but rather the data itself was rich enough and that the anonymization process itself wasn't sufficient to preserve privacy. And the New York Times had journalists who dug into the data and were able to um, expose an individual in that data set and I think called to her home and gave her, gave her a printout of her, um, of her internet searches, uh, which would be quite scary for most of us, I'd imagine. Um, and to give you an idea of how you'd run an attack like that, I'm sure everybody on this call has searched their own name in Google or your favorite search engine um, in, in the recent past. And I would suggest, I, I would uh, wager that you've searched your own name far more than anybody else on the planet. Um, so it's these kind of keys that you have to very rich microdata that you can use to expose sensitivities when anonymization isn't done right. And the last example I have is more of a fun kind of example, I guess, involving the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. So they published a data set of anonymized taxi trip records in New York City, and a blogger was able to de-anonymize it and um, using photos on the internet was actually able to uh, single out uh, taxi trips that celebrities had taken and find out the uh, long lats of where they were traveling from and to and how much they were tipping the driver. So um, that's more of a, I guess, a more modern uh, uh, e example of anonymization gone wrong. Um, but in, in, I guess, in, in a lot of these examples, there are very small things that you could change to make the attacks that were uh, implemented a lot more difficult. And I guess that's sidestepping the, the point of privacy in general is actually quite difficult to achieve well. Um, so these three examples were examples of data sets published in the wild and then subsequently attacked by some clever researchers or journalists. But we know that similar risks exist when you're giving access to data sets, um, for, for example, for analysis, for doing statistical querying. And there's this uh, database reconstruction theorem that I'm going to paraphrase that says, um, if you allow enough accurate queries to be executed on a data set, that then you can reconstruct that data set in its entirety. Um, so it's very important that we, we think long and hard about the techniques we're going to use for privacy. As Frederico was talking about, he mentioned previously that we use all these techniques to manage risk. And it's important to understand the limitations of the tools that we're using. Um, so hopefully that will serve as a bit of a primer to, I guess, why differential privacy exists and why it was conceived as a result of all these failings of traditional anonymization. And I think I'll hand back to, to Jack now. Thanks, Nisha. I think it really comes to light when you see the, you know, me I mean, mess ups. Like, I, I feel like none of these examples are people trying to maliciously share and expose sensitive data for some dubious gains. But even if they're, you know, even if it's well intended, often the information itself can actually cause more harm than good. So I, I see more questions mm -hmm. coming in on this, so we're collecting them for the Q&A session. Um, but we'll pass over now to Robert Prasarsic, who um, is the CEO of a company called Oblivious um, that, that works on, on uh, generally input privacy, which I think he will explain very shortly. Um, he'll talk us through about the kind of landscape of privacy enhancing technologies, not simply, you know, any of the kind of classical techniques or, or even just differential privacy, but actually giving a more holistic view of the landscape. So over to you, Rob. Thank you, thank you, Jack. Um, can you see my screen? Just uh, uh... we can indeed. Okay. You're not in uh, slideshow mode yet, though. Just is it now in slideshow mode? You are no longer sharing the screen. <laughs> okay, sorry. Maybe let me then just share the whole screen, and that should work. Is it working now? Perfect. You're in business now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, yeah, I think the um, uh, Nisha and Federica have done a fantastic job 
really motivating why we need to care about privacy, especially when we're dealing with sensitive data, when anonymization can go wrong. Um, so kind of, let's say, some of the traditional techniques um, and therefore why we might need a new toolkit and we need to think carefully about the toolkit uh, that we're using when dealing with um, sensitive information. Um, so, and that toolkit really, uh, really goes under, uh, often goes under the name of privacy enhancing technologies. So the point of this kind of short presentation is to um, basically categorize those privacy and technologies um, and, and introduce some of them, especially the ones that will be uh, part of the hackathon and the competition. Um, so privacy and enhancing technologies are really about kind of this art and science of balancing data usability and, uh, and privacy. Um, and when you think about that, you know, the, the, if you really want to make sure that your data stays private, you shouldn't collect them in the first place and never share them. But of course, a lot of projects, we do need to share them or we do need to process them. Um, so privacy and ethic technologies will not solve all of those issues for it um, uh, when it comes to privacy, but they can offer risk mitigation that actually may be a difference between, you know, whether the project actually goes ahead or not. Um, and can really kind of tackle some of those um, uh, risks associated with processing sensitive data. Very broad again from high level, um, you know, we'd like to categorize those. There's a lot of privacy and technologies and I've got Nisha mentioned differential privacy, you can have things like KK anonymity and, and so on and so forth. Um, but maybe let's put some order into it so we can categorize them as input and output privacy. Um, and that really kind of follows was like from a definition of a computation of a fun or a function, right? A function takes some input uh, uh, and then, you know, or a computation, and then it produces some output. Um, and that's really kind of also how input and output privacy come into this. So input privacy is really about how do we want to make sure that the inputs to the computation stay private, right? So if you, it's a very simple, um, you, and they kind of, and they don't expose, and they're not exposed to other parties taking part in the computation. A very simple example might be, you know, you can imagine uh, Nisha and myself having each respective customers list, and we would like to find out, for example, how many joint customers we might have. But what we don't want to expose to each other during this computation is, our whole list of customers, right? So we just want to find out how many joint customers we have. So that really is what an input privacy is about. Um, output privacy on the other um, side is really how do you want to make sure, how to make sure that from the output of the computation, you cannot reverse engineer the inputs, right? So when you're publishing different statistics, different even aggregate statistics like you know, the number of joint customers, but it can be you know, some demographics data and so on and so forth, how do you make sure that from different data points, you cannot reverse engineer uh, the um, original inputs? Um, so that's kind of the two categories. Um, but of course, you can achieve those in many different ways and there are different associated technologies. When it comes to input privacy, right? So those kind of ensuring that the inputs um, of uh, from different parties stay private during the computation. Um, there are kind of typically three ways to do that. Um, the old way would be to give basically the inputs from different parties to a trusted third party. You know, maybe it might be an international organization or it might be uh, you know, a typically a consulting company or law company uh, that we all trust as parties. Um, and then we can give them the, the inputs. They will process the data on our behalf and return the outputs to their respective parties. But of course, that's not scalable. Um, that's not really how you know data science uh, in this day and age works, um, and that's not, uh, of course, a technological solution to to achieve that. Um, and then there are two other technological ways to to ensure input privacy, and that's to do with secure enclaves and kind of encryption based methods. Um, so let me say a few more things about a few more words about about uh, each of them. When it comes to encryption based methods. These are really the methods that um, kind of started in the 1970s and have been uh, the cornerstone of cryptography research for the last few decades. And what they're about is they're about um, processing data and manip manipulating the data um, uh, directly on ciphertext, right? So you encrypt the data and you, uh, and you can uh, perform the direct computation without ever decrypting that data. So directly on ciphertext. 
An example of that is homomorphic encryption, where you can, for example, you know, let's say I have some data, I can encrypt them, and I can send them to send these encrypted data sets to external server, and the server can add and multiply uh, my data. Um, so perform computation, therefore perform any polynomial without ever decrypting these data sets. Um, and that's really kind of all, almost like part of, a, of the whole field of kind of secure multi-party computation, where you can have two or more parties um, um, that can evaluate joint function on encrypted data sets. So not just, um, uh, you know, um, uh, delegating uh, computation to an external server. And that's really composed of many different uh, cryptographic primitives. Uh, one of them uh, is, for example, like secret sharing, where each party can almost like split their inputs between uh, many different parties, such that no single party can learn anything about that input. Um, only if you aggregate the kind of this, the, the shares from different parties, you can recover the inputs, right? But no single parties could do that. And there are other um, techniques and, and, and cryptographic kind of primitive protocols uh, that, that form different protocols around secure multi-party computation. They're, they're, of course, a great premise, right? So you can always uh, perform computation directly on uh, encrypted data. But there are some associated uh, challenges, and that, that really applies to each technique that we'll always uh, be describing here, right? So there are some great things about them, but you always need to be also careful about some of the associated challenges or risks. Uh, with encryption-based methods, you often have a very large computational and communication overheads, so they can be painfully slow. Um, homomorphic encryption doing, for example, polynomial approximations, um, and especially when you're talking about um, uh, kind of production um, deployments, and there might also be challenges associated with the lack of standardization, for example, when it comes to some of those um, techniques. Um, so the second way to achieve um, input privacy is through something called secure enclaves, also some of those trusted execution environments or confidential computing, different names, but essentially same things. Um, and enclaves are really like a normal server, uh, but with a couple of uh, special superpowers. Um, so firstly, enclaves have, they basically isolated from the rest of the computing environment, and they have very limited input and output, right? So nobody, even like a system administrator, cannot SSH or look into the machine, read log files, or see, you know, the data that uh, that are being processed inside of the enclave. Um, and the second property is that the underlying infrastructure um, can issue something called cryptographic attestation document. It's essentially like an ID that basically guarantees the software and the code and all the environment variables um, around it, the being of, of the code that's run inside of the enclave. And so you have guarantees, strict guarantees about what's being run inside, and you have this isolation. And through the attestation document, you can you can use that to, to establish a secure connection with the enclave, right? So you can make sure that you have authenticated and authorized users that can communicate with the enclaves, um, and, and through that you can attest basically the server, so this enclave-enabled server, um, and that gives you, you know, secure end-to-end -end connection to enclaves, such that you can, you know, send encrypted data, and these data will, and only authorized parties can do that to the enclave, and these data will be decrypted within the enclave to run specific pre-approved application. Um, so enclaves are now, of course, widely available, um, but um, and as you can now realize, there's some positives. Uh, over some other techniques, for example, you you don't have any overheads because it's um, the computation is really run on plain text. But of course, there are challenges, right? So you have a very different trust model. Now you need to trust either a hardware provider or you need to trust particular uh, cloud uh, when it comes to enclaves. And there are also um, ways that you know you can, in principle, attack them. So you need to think about things like uh, side channel attacks or timing attacks when designing applications to be run within enclaves. Um, now turning into output privacy. Um, so output privacy, yet again, there are different techniques that can be uh, used to achieve output privacy, right? So to how to make sure that from the outputs of the computation, you cannot reverse engineer the inputs. Um, as, as Federico was saying, there are, um, of course, statistical data, data disclosure controls from different anonymization techniques like uh, K-anonymity, uh, to you know aggregation and sensitivity analysis it's like very careful analysis how you're going to disseminate your data um, there are also 
some more recent techniques like differential privacy. And I think James um, is going to talk in far more detail about this. So I won't spend too much time on it, uh, but essentially it's, you know, it's a mathematical, differential privacy is mathematical definition of output privacy. Um, and it can be affected and it's most uh, often uh, affected through essentially perturbation of the output. So of adding appropriate level of noise to the output such that it guarantees that you cannot say anything about the individuals in the underlying uh, data set. Um, synthetic data is yet another um, kind of pri output privacy technique, um, and it really is about creating a fake data set that mimics the original uh, data set, like through correlations or um, you know, uh, particular uh, statistical pro properties without actually having any um, of the sensitive um, um, underlying, uh, you know, uh, for example, personally identifiable uh, information. Um, synthetic data can, yet again, have differential privacy guarantees, and I think we can, we'll also be talking about that, where you have those mathematical guarantees about, about output privacy. So that really is kind of very much the whole um, ecosystem of, uh, uh, of, uh, of privacy and seek technologies. And I think the exciting part about this uh, hackathon is that, uh, that both input privacy and output privacy techniques will be part of it. So in particular, secure enclaves and differential privacy and differential privacy synthetic data uh, will form, uh, uh, will, will be used in, in that hackathon. So uh, if there are any questions, Again, happy to uh, answer them at the end of the Q&A session. Thank you. Great, thank you, Rob. So <laughs> I see more questions coming in. So um, I'll copy these into, into the thing for the Q&A at, at the end. But now we can pass over uh, to James Honecker. So James is the Chief Privacy Engineer of OpenDP um, and a research scientist in the Statistics of Privacy Group at Meta, uh, where he works on differential privacy applications at scale at Meta's advertising models. Um, he's very well known in the space and is probably one of the most appropriate people to um, introduce differential privacy uh, to the group. So we're delighted to have you. Thanks very much, James, and I'll pass it over to you. Lovely, thank you. Um, I'm attempting to share. Let's see if we can do. Might be confused by having multiple screens. Your computer is too private. It's not willing to. Uh... <laughs> Absolutely. Like like differential privacy is not just a, you know, it's just not just a mathematical theorem. It, it's a it's a way of life. Um, so uh, let me see. If I unplug my machine, maybe uh, we'll have a little more luck. Maybe as a useful. Um, I think we can do for the time being is we actually got some co some questions in. So instead of leaving them to the Q and A at the end, um, if James needs a few minutes, I guess we can probably go through some of these in the meantime. So these are in no particular order because <laughs> they're kind of copied um, uh, at different points. So we'll get through all of them. Um, but so Matt Weldon asked, are there quantum safe homomorphic encryption methods? So Rob, maybe you're best place to to answer that? Um, so yes, um, in a sense that um, there are post quantum. So we have this, you know, all this kind of cryptography primitives like RSA and Dickie Hellman and so on that uh, I believe, I mean, that we have basically an algorithm that they could, if we have a quantum on a quantum computer that can hack it in a polynomial time, right? So they're not quantum resistant. And there are those other protocols, um, so-called post quantum uh, cryptography protocols that are believed to be secure against quantum computers. And those are, for example, based on lattice-based cryptography. Um, and um, most of the fully homomorphic encryption scheme uh, in use, like uh, uh, Toric fully homomorphic encryption scheme and so on, they're based on lattice-based cryptography. Um, and as such are believed to be secure against uh, uh, quantum computer attacks uh, as of now. Thanks, thanks, Rob. We can keep fielding questions, and, and James, hopefully, you can give us a thumbs up when you're when you're good to go. <laughs> so, uh, Sakania asked, uh, "Are enclaves, sorry, are enclaves, uh, hardware or software? Can they run on your local machine? Does it require purchase of specific equipment, etc., cetera, etc.?" Cetera? 
Um, so pass that back over to you. Absolutely. Um, so when it comes to enclaves, they're both like hardware-based enclaves. So actually, almost like the story of enclave starts with Intel SGX in 2014, uh, where they roll out a separate piece of silicon um, um, that uh, that had a, kind of two properties, um, right? Kind of isolation, and um, it could attest the software that's being run inside. Um, and you could, of course, buy the physical chips. Uh, now, they're also actually like software sort of enclaves, uh, in a sense, kind of hypervisor-based enclaves. So essentially, over the last couple of years, a lot of cloud providers have realized that they could also offer similar uh, properties. Um, so they could guarantee the code that's being run within enclaves and separate it from the rest of the environment, such that even the host um, of, the, of the enclaves cannot look inside. Um, and these don't have, for example, limitations in terms of such limitations in terms of memory, like Intel SGX, which has, for example, like 128 megabytes of um, uh, memory limitation, and so on. So they're they're both kind of hardware-based enclaves and, say, hypervisor-based enclaves uh, from cloud providers. Yeah, great. And I think I think the point in, in both of those contexts is that. Um, like ninety percent of it seems to seems to be people using their cloud or managing their own um, uh, data centers and buying physical infrastructure. I don't. Although, if you have an iPhone, there is actually an enclave uh, in it <laughs> that that does some of the work. Um, James, are, do you think we're good to go at this point? I believe he is. Awesome. Okay, I believe he's frozen. So um, let's I'll scroll up. Um, another question from Oleg um, said, Rob, if we have to trust the owner of the hardware, uh, I need the enclave anyway, why don't we trust like a key management service, a KMS hardware to manage keys and provide protections from hosting providers, e.g. AWS, uh, the same way? Would KMS amount to uh, sufficient supplementary measures for transfer to the US, etc. Um, yeah, uh, when it comes to the, um, the kind of the, but this is sufficient supplementary measure for transfer, uh, I cannot really comment on that. Uh, it's really kind of the question to the lawyers and of course, part of the whole discussion around uh, SHRAMS2 and um, um, and sending, for example, data between the EU and the US. Um, so I don't think there is any definite answer when it comes to that. Um, however, when it comes to the um, uh, key management and uh, um, the, and, and kind of the hardware-based enclaves, really, that that's almost like exactly what, what you're saying when it comes to like what the clouds have realized, right? So what you can do is that you can essentially now trust the cloud um, and ultimately, for example, you know, case of AWS, the AWS certificate authority, or in the case, you know, of other clouds, their respective key management services and and, and certificate authorities, um, when it comes to the, um, you know, the guarantees about what's being run inside. So you can have kind of the, the hardware uh, guarantees if, you, if you're more concerned about, um, you know, you don't trust the cloud, for example, and you really want to make sure that um, that it's actually you know, the producer of the chip that provides these guarantees together with through the attestation mechanism with, for example, the cloud provider, but neither of the parties solely um, uh, can, can reveal all of that information. Um, or you decide, okay, I just trust the cloud provider. Yeah, so may maybe as well, just to clarify, so the, like a KMS, key management service on AWS, for example, you typically store keys, symmetric or asymmetric keys, and then you have either people or servers or, or armies, et cetera, that have access to receive them to encrypt or decrypt some data. So the inclusion of enclaves is, is kind of a step forward. So it's like the EC2 server itself running specific pre-approved code and the handshake that it does to the KMS um, gives it access to a key. So you can, instead of saying this server or this person has access, you can actually say, uh, isolated environment that's running this specific image is is the only thing that has access to maybe decrypt a particular amount of data. So they're often used in in conjunction with one another. Um, 
as a you know as opposed to separate. And um, okay, great. So may as well field uh, another question for the time being. So CP said as to the regards to TEE enclaves. By the way, these are all <laughs> enclave questions. It's just because they were the the most recent ones. While Rob was still on here. Um, as to the regards uh, to trust execution environment enclaves, um, it is specialized hardware that comes in current uh, in, in some Intel servers. Uh, basically, when the server was, oh, this is an explanation. OK, that's not a question. That's totally fine. So um, I can roll up. OK, so there was a question from Matthew uh, Bush. I believe this would have been to Frederica. Um, saying, are there any other privacy risks other than re-identification for UNHCR? Are there risks to whole groups of people uh, as well, depending on information that gets disclosed? So I can imagine there'll be different subgroups within refugees or something, which potentially um, might be very sensitive characteristics as an entire group, as opposed to just at an individual level. Uh, do you have any comments on that, uh, Frederico? Yes, absolutely. Uh, there is also this kind of disclosure that is possible to happen. And for example, just to give an example, you could have like a subset uh, of, uh, of people that even if you cannot disclose uh, the individuals, you can still say that uh, people belonging to this group have these particular characteristics. So, for example, just to give a practical example, you could tell in some circumstances that in one camp, refugee camp, most of the refugee or all of them belong to a particular minority. So, in this case, uh, even if you cannot disclose uh, the individuals, you can still uh, uh, disclose some characteristic of individuals that are in that camp. So, we do check these as well. Uh, uh, in the data and checking what is sensitive, uh, sensitive uh, particularly sensitive, and uh, also we use uh, as sensitivity. That was another question um, to see what are the numbers of uh, the diversity in uh, each camp or for uh, some sensitive uh, uh, variable. But to answer also to answer to Oleg, Lino, since it was related, uh, we don't have uh, a standard value for L value because uh, also depends on the values that can uh, the sensitive variable assume. So there is some discretionality in the decision making. It's also why uh, differential privacy could be more scalable. And just to answer quickly to Oleg as well, they ask the economy level that we apply. Uh, typically, we apply key economy or level three. Uh, we decide this level uh, looking at the literature, doing some tests, uh, also discussing with other organizations. They use the same methods, and we came up with this uh, this standard. Over. Well, thanks. Thank you so much for clarifying that, Federico. So I think uh, James is back, and I now have the slides on this side. So I'll share screen, um, and hopefully, screen up, and hopefully we can go from there. Can everyone see the the slides? Lovely. Um, so, yeah. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. It's uh, it was uh, it's it's very rare that I that I get to be in the uh, situation of um. Um, having such such a nice foundation set up by the by the other speakers, um, so you'll see that in these particular slides, uh, there's a quick review of some of these 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 things we've already talked about, and uh, we, we can skip through those. Um, uh, my name's James. Uh, uh, I'm a research scientist at Meta. I work uh, primarily on differential privacy, but hearkening back to the, the Oblivious talk. Um, differential privacy in and of itself it gives you output privacy, but you, if you want an end-to-end -end private solution, often um, uh, what's really interesting and, and what's sort of at the forefront of, of innovative research is ways to combine differential privacy with other privacy-enhancing techniques. Um, so ways of privacy, uh, you know, 
protecting privacy over the computation itself. And so combining differential privacy as an output layer with multi-party computation with enclaves as talked about with homomorphic encryption um, is, is really exciting in, in building real systems. And, uh, and, and it's, it, it's, it'll be exciting to see what kinds of uh, solutions people come up with uh, in, in, in this hackathon. It's, it's a it's really interesting um, uh, proposal to be to be playing with um, in the live uh, in this in this pro project. Okay, um, go, let's see what the next slide is. Ah, okay. So uh, we've we've talked a lot about uh, already uh, in, in the first talk about um, uh, the different types of linkage attacks and reconstruction attacks that are that are po that are possible in the world. If we skip to say like slide 21, 22, um, way down there. Um, I'll just say uh, here's a bunch of attacks. They've been they've been next one, please. Um, the 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 fundamental sort of thing that we're pressing up against here, uh, this 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 sort of information theoretic uh, result by Diener and Nissim that 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 sort of launches a lot of the the, the pets world, uh, you know, 20 years ago perhaps, is this idea that um, if you start releasing information. Uh, and you release too many query answers on a data set or with too much uh, or, or, or with too much precision, you will eventually leak the underlying data. There will be a way to reconstruct from the answers that you've that you've released what the underlying data is. And sometimes that's really interesting, you know, really, really simple sort of linkage attacks to auxiliary information. Sometimes it's the fact that every time you release information, you're learning a little bit more about the underlying data and eventually there's only one underlying data set that could have given you all those possible answers. And so what we see is that as you start releasing more and more answers, we can we can in, in increasingly sophisticated ways start to reconstruct what the underlying data must have been to give you those answers. OK, unless you steeply limit how many queries you're going to allow on the data set and then just end things, OK, which is unsatisfying or we add sufficient noise um, to, uh, to to provide privacy, and that's that's what differential privacy is going to allow. It's going to allow us to, I would say, um, still learn the underlying truths of the data set, which is what we want. We often want generalized knowledge. We want scientific truths about the the uh, statistical truths about the broad population, uh, but not learn anything about individuals. Um, it's a way of, if you will, of, of politely a polite lying. Um, in 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 my original work, you know, my, my own background is in statistics and, and originally in statistics, I studied a lot of, of missing data and measurement error problems. And if you will, differential privacy is an intentional, very, very small form of measurement error. And we know how to correct for these things. Um, and the measurement error is going to allow us um, politely to lie to the, the data analyst uh, in such a way that we can protect, protect privacy. Um, so uh, let's skip uh, perhaps uh, next slide. Um, differential privacy, perfect. Uh, one more. Um, uh, and one more. Okay, so uh, we've seen that differential privacy is is not in and of itself uh, an end-to-end -end solution uh, in, in a in in a system. It's it's one particular layer, and there and it's often the case that you want uh, clever combinations with other privacy-enhancing techniques. But it is. It is the form of it, it is the output layer of, of, of many systems. It's the way that the actual answers when they get out into the world at large uh, can be guaranteed to still protect the confidentiality of the data that generated those answers. OK, so next, next, next slide. OK, and we've seen um, um, as this literature has been maturing that we have uh, real large scale deployments by 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 large uh, Tech groups, uh, you know, Apple, Google, Microsoft, um, uh, all building systems for for users. Um, Opacus here at Meta, um, very impressive work to move the U.S. Census Bureau to, um, to to differential privacy for for exactly these reasons that the U.S. Census Bureau releases literally millions upon millions of of, of summaries to the data set, and and they proved that it was it was possible from all that information to reconstruct the underlying data, and so differential privacy was necessary. Okay, so next slide. So what do we mean by differential privacy? Uh, we'll try to do this a little bit rapid fire here. So let's say there is an underlying data set. Uh, here it's um, a bunch of individuals, and we know their their gender, their blood type, and, and say uh, also a particularly sensitive attribute, like uh, what is their disease status? 
and we have a bunch of analysts uh, who look um, you know, like cartoon characters here, but 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 uh, but very benevolent souls who are trying to learn fundamental truths for social good, uh, making queries of this data set. And so they ask queries of the data set and they get back answers. And the and the 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 work that's cited on the top line here, the Diener and Nissim says, well, if they ask too many questions, some more malicious soul, let's say go to the next slide, would be able to take all of the answers uh, from those queries and reconstruct what the underlying data must have been in order to have gotten those answers uh, probably with 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 probability one that is going to happen as more answers come out of the data set okay so instead what we're going to do um, is we're going to have an intermediary here called a curator and that might run in say a trusted execution environment like 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 we were just talking about with the oblivious um, where we're not going to give back exact answers anymore we're going to get back answers with just a finely precision weighted amount of noise added to the answers and the noise is going to be guided so as to make sure that we can uh, um, drown out the contribution of any one individual in the data set to those answers and so um, differential privacy as as, as de further developed by by, by cynthia dork here uh, adam smith kobe nissim frank mcsherry um, is, is not an algorithm, it's a definition. It's a mathematical definition. And if your analysis meets that definition, then it inherits a bunch of properties which are really, really gold standard, strong uh, privacy properties um, that, that we can reason about formally. And we can make uh, absolute guarantees um, that no matter how malicious this adversary is, no matter what attacks they know, no matter how much auxiliary information they have, they might even know attacks that don't exist in the literature yet or completely future proof. They might have um, unbelievable computational resources. Uh, with all of that, um, they're not going to be able to, to, to learn the underlying information in the data set. Uh, so how are we going to do this? Um, the underlying intuition of differential privacy is going to be in this data set here. Let's, let's see what the next slide looks like. If we take any one record, let's say this is Alice's right record, and Alice is thinking, should I add my data to this data to this data set, knowing that some malicious adversary might be able to work out my disease status, or should I say, no, no, actually, I worry about my privacy, so I'm not going to add my data into this scientific file. So let's try the next next slide. Okay, so here Alice just decided, oh, actually, I'm not going to join the data set. Differential privacy provides a guarantee that the set of answers that are coming back from the curator are indistinguishable to the adversary, regardless of which situation you were in. If Alice provides her data to the data set or she removes her data from the data set, there is enough noise coming out of the answers of the curator that to the adversary, the answers look absolutely indistinguishable. Indistinguishable. OK, even under the worst case, under the worst case data set, under the worst case knowledge the adversary might have, under the worst case attributes of Alice, she might be a particularly large outlier. Um, the adversary cannot tell whether we are in data set where we are in data set two here where Alice does not is not in the data or or, or data set one where she was. Um, or let's see what the, the next next slide looks like. Even if um, oh, oh, back up one, uh, even if we, for example, changed all the attributes of Alice. So Alice could uh, be in the data set, not be in the data set, uh, change her values, uh, you know, report honestly or or report report lies. Um, the adversary is not going to be able to tell from the distribution of outputs which of the states of the world we're in. And so Alice's assurance is, oh, I may as well join the data set because I'm contributing to, say, a social good. We're going to learn how, uh, how to classify this disease or, or how to cure it. Um, and no malicious adversary is going to be able to tease out my information from that data set. They're only going to be able to tease out population level statistical truths. OK, next, next line. Here's the here's the formal way we're going to guarantee this. And this looks like a lot of mathematics, um, but really it, it hinges on these these two Greek uh, pieces that are one of which is hiding in here right now, one of which we'll turn up in a second. Uh, the, uh, let, let's, let's see what the next slide. OK, so on the left and the right, we're thinking of two possible queries under two neighboring data sets. So a neighboring data sets are data sets that only differ by one person's information. Alice is or is not in the data set or she's changed her values. OK, and what we're saying is it needs to be in indistinguishable uh, in the outputs, which of these worlds we're in. So if we have two neighboring data sets, D and D prime, next slide. 
and somebody is running a model on those data sets. So let's just say that's M. So, uh, and a model here might be very general. It might be we're releasing some means, or it might be we're doing a machine learning process on, on these things, or we're creating a bunch of SQL aggregations, some mechanism that says, data in, output out, okay? And then I'm going to make a decision on that. I'm gonna say, oh, well, if the model says this, I think Alice is in the data. And if the model says it's not, I think Alice is not in the data. Or if the model says this, uh, I'm gonna do this in the world and, and I'm doing that because I think Alice has this disease. Um, so that's the next slide. Uh, that's this um, element in T. So you've got a query on that data set and, a, and T is a, is a rule that, that, is, that is distinguishing which world we're in. OK, then the ne then what our total definition here says is the probability of taking an action in, in, in data set D or the probability of taking the uh, action in data set D prime is is indistinguishable up to a small uh, factor e, e to the epsilon. And so epsilon is judging how close, how indistinguishable the results have to be in order for us to be uh, confident that an adversary cannot tell which 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 data the world which which of the which, which state of the world we're in, and in this particular case, um, epsilon is a is a is a small number uh, that is judging how much privacy we're leaking by by creating a query in this data set. Next next slide. Okay, so um, we use epsilon a lot. Epsilon is at the the center and the heart of differential privacy. It allows us to. Um, uh, determine how much information loss there is uh, uh, when we when we make differentially private releases from a database. Um, mathematically, the ratio is we're going to guarantee that 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 the distribution of all possible answers is within this this indistinguishability ratio e to the epsilon. For small epsilon, that's approximately one plus epsilon. So if I'm saying I'm using an epsilon of, of 0.01, then I'm saying uh, the difference between my answers when I'm in the data set and when I'm not in the data set in the worst case is roughly one plus 0.01. So epsilon can be roughly judged as sort of a, uh, for small epsilons, a, a, a sort of relative prob uh, probability of, 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 of uh, uh, ratio of, of, of the distribution of two possible answers. Next, next slide. Okay, how does this actually work? So for every statistic that we might release out of a data set, we need to determine what is the worst, um, what is the largest amount of, of that any one individual in the data set could have affected that, that answer. So if I'm releasing a mean, for example, here, that center line, next slide, um, and I think, okay, what's the most that Alice could have possibly done to the mean? Well, the most she could move the mean on her own is to move from the lowest extreme of the data set to the highest extreme of the data set, and that would have shifted the data set uh, shifted the mean to the right by this this quantity here, uh, GS, the, the the global sensitivity. That's the most that Alice could possibly ever, in the worst case, regardless of what the data is, regardless of what her data is, affect the mean. Um, you know, and it's a function of one over n, so it decays really, really fast. If, if n's big, that's a small amount that she can affect that. And what we're going to do is we're going to add data sufficient to guarantee that we always drown out that global sensitivity. However much Alice could affect the data by, we're going to add noise to mask that. Next slide. Um, in order to do that, normally the data is going to have to have bounds. Um, so if she could affect the data from negative infinity to positive infinity, then that's not going to be possible. We're going to have to uh, uh, make sure that she can only affect the, 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 the data by a, by a fixed amount. And that normally means that pragmatically, it's important to take most of our data and clamp it to a particular range. There's a lot of art in that. Uh, it's very, very core to almost all the mechanisms that we'll be using. Um, it's underappreciated in the theory literature, but it, but it's very well understood by data scientists who are really using this. So understanding what the bounds are of the data, um, you know, and and if we all come from different fields, machine learning, statistics, uh, data science, we might have different terms in our head, but they all, all sort of mean the same thing. Uh, clipping the data to that particular range. Uh, next slide, uh, maybe two more. Yep, one more. Uh, again, that's that's a real art. Uh, so if you back up to our meme, uh, getting the clipping bounds right is uh, is 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 really really core here and uh, and central to a lot of these algorithms. Um, um, so what we're doing here in this particular slide is is if there are two alternate data sets, let's say the blue data set and the red data set, one of which has Alice and one of which doesn't have Alice, this is the distribution of noisy answers that we might give. Uh, to the mean when Alice is in the data set and Alice isn't in the data set. And if the answer to the mean that we get back out is 1.3, we could say, oh, well, the uh, probability I would have seen 1.3 is, 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 this, is this blue height. 
uh, in one state of the world and the red height in the other state of the world. And I can't judge those two. Those two probabilities are so close to each other that, that that's indistinguishable to me. OK, next slide. So generally speaking, we're going to add noise to answers. Uh, sometimes we're going to use the Laplace distribution because the mathematics works out really, really nice. Sometimes we're going to use the Gaussian distribution because as data scientists or statisticians, we're very, very used to thinking, oh, if I'm adding a little bit of error or if there's an error in my process or if there's a central limit theorem kicking in, then Gaussian noise is very sort of conformable and convenient and, and, and a thing that we're all used to thinking about. Um, but the Laplace is, is, is a simpler way to think about this mathematically. So I'll, I'll put, post these slides, but uh, let's uh, express through the next couple of slides. Um, what we're going to do is this M here, if there is a if there's a real answer in the data set Q, we're going to add a draw from the Laplace noise, which has a uh, variance sufficient to drown out the answer that Alice Alice could have could have added to that that uh, next slide. And ratios of uh, Laplaces are, are you know, a, a mirroring of the exponential distribution. Gaussians will also use very, very commonly too, which is a more common distribution. Next slide. And uh, and the nice thing about Laplaces is, is that their ratios are constant. And so if we want to guarantee that, that the ratio of answers is e to the epsilon, well, then um, the ratios of the Laplaces will, will in, in fact be a constant. So it, it, the mathematics works out very, very nice. So often Laplace is used for small numbers of queries. Often Gaussians are used for large number of queries or when downstream we want to think of it as a measurement error process. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a couple more. Uh, one more. OK, uh, backup one. So this epsilon again is is the core privacy parameter here, right? It is a measure of uh, what is what do we mean for two answers to be indistinguishable such that we can't learn from them um, or, or we can't determine which state of the world we're in. Um, it's it's a number. Uh, it's typically a small number, um, possibly a single digit number, some generally a number less than one. Um, as that number gets smaller, we're saying there is more noise in the data. We need more indistinguishability. And uh, and we're going to get a wider distribution of noisy answers. OK, so epsilon on, on the equal to two on the left, we're seeing two fairly distinct distributions, right? If uh, if I'm greater than 4.5, I'm probably in the blue distribution. If I'm less than that, I'm probably in the red one. Whereas at epsilon of 0 0.5, it's it's it, those two distributions overlap much more. OK, so epsilon is a measure of privacy loss. And next slide. Uh, the great thing about epsilon um, and so one nice thing about these noise mechanisms is you say, uh, you often will uh, your first panic will be if you're a data scientist who's used to squeezing as much utility out of your data sets as you possibly can. You're like, why am I adding noise to this data that I just carefully collected and is incredibly valuable to me? But there are all forms. There are lots of forms of noise in data sets already. You have measurement error. You have sampling error. You have the fact that your model that you're using is not exactly the data generating process in the world. So you've got model error. And the kinds of the level of noise that we generally have to add into data sets to con to allow privacy uh, decreases faster, asymptotically decays faster than other kinds of error that we're very comfortable with in our data, such as sampling error. So sampling error, for example, is this red dashed line here and shows what is the sampling error of the of, of an estimate of a mean as as the number of observations increases. And you see it drops, you know, central limit theorem um, uh, and the. Um, the colored lines are the error that I have to add at different levels of epsilon. And what we see is for this mean mechanism, the noise that I have to add for privacy, eventually as the data gets large enough, is going to be less than the sampling error. So if you really care about error, I think the takeaway point is go get more data. Don't, don't bother me about error I have to add because of privacy, if, if privacy is an ethical good in, in your data set. Okay, uh, two more slides and I think we're done. Next slide. Okay, uh, oops, back, back up one. OK, so the the, the key point here, uh, the, 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 what I said was differential privacy is a definition. It's not it's not an algorithm. Uh, the Laplace mechanism, the Gaussian mechanism are two algorithms that meet that definition. There are lots of other uh, basic building blocks. Um, the exponential mechanism is a way to choose from a set in a in a in a privacy preserving way. 
Uh, stochastic gradient descent is a way to optimize a model in a privacy preserving way. Uh, anything that meets the differentially private uh, definition is going to inherit these three really useful properties. And this is what's going to allow us to build a tool or build an analysis or um, put together things that other people are doing in different uh, and, and create one giant thing that is itself differentially private. So uh, the three properties that are really core here, one is post-processing, which is once I've released something that's differentially private, it's yours to do with as you please. There's nothing you can do on the differentially private release that can undo the privacy. This is not like cryptography where if you learn the key, you can break the code. Um, there's there's nothing from an information perspective uh, that's going to break the uh, the the privacy guarantee that the differential privacy is offering you, the indistinguishability criteria. Um, second is programmability, which means that if you have a bunch of individual things that are each themselves individually differentially private, then their combination is also differentially private. So I can do action one on the data set and that's differentially private. I can use that in another algorithm later on and create something more sophisticated and do something else that's differentially private. That combination is still going to be differentially private or I can release a whole bunch of statistics and together they're going to be differentially private. So it allows us to use the basic differentially private building blocks and put them together or knit them together in whatever clever way we want to create an analysis and very simply say, well, if all the component parts are differentially private, the total thing is differentially private, which is why these frameworks um, that we might be exploring, particularly OpenDP, are really, really valuable. They give you the building blocks and then you as the data scientist can knit them together in whatever clever way you want. Um, what's core though is also this last property composition, which is if you have done a bunch of things which each individually um, are differentially private at some epsilon. We can also reason mathematically about what the total privacy loss, what the total epsilon globally across all the different things you've done on the data set are. So um, next, next slide, the next and hopefully last slide. Um, so the simplest way to reason about, about an epsilon if we've done multiple queries in the worst case is just to add them together. So if I've spent uh, some amount of epsilon, say 0.1 on, on my first query, and then I'm using that in my second query, and I spend another 0.1, then my total epsilon across my entire analysis in the absolute worst case is 0.2. And I can keep summing that up, and I can decide, okay, have I spent yet an epsilon that I'm, uh, that I'm comfortable with? Um, maybe the total epsilon, maybe the total indistinguishability that I'm, or information that I'm willing to leak out of my data set is two, and I say, have I got to that budget yet? If I haven't got to that budget, then I can keep building my analysis or I can change my algorithm, I can spend more. There are cases in which um, um, the way the epsilons add is, is less conservative than this, less aggressive, and, and you can pack a lot of more epsilons into your total budget. Next, next slide. The math there is a little bit complicated, but this is generally um, abstracted away for you in lots of frameworks. So for example, OpenDP will look at the epsilons and look at the way in which they were called and say, oh, actually I don't have to add them together linearly. I can add them together sublinearly or something like that. Um, and so we can sometimes um, work out that the, the total privacy spend is, is uh, what it is by, by, by using these, these composition theorems. Um, so uh, next slide, last slide, I think. Uh, one more. Thanks, Jack. Uh, one more. Uh, and just go until this screen fills up. Um, so again, the uh, the underlying uh, concepts here are there is oops one back up one. Uh, there is a privacy loss definition. That is what differential privacy gives us. It says indistinguishability gives us a privacy guarantee. It allows Alice to contribute her data and know that it can't be reconstructed. In order to add noise to achieve that uh, indistinguishability criteria, we're going to have to work out what the sensitivity of a function is. Uh, how much can Alice possibly change the distribution of answers that are coming out and add noise sufficient to drop that? The way that we judge indistinguishability is this criteria epsilon. Uh, epsilon is the, the fundamental differential privacy parameter. Under some other definitions of privacy loss, there are other parameters such as delta and rho. Delta is 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 a is generally a, um, a very very small parameter that we have to introduce once we start using Gaussian distributions because we said that the uh, uh, differential privacy is a is a statement about ratios and the tail the extreme tails of Gaussian distributions do not behave well in terms of ratios. And so uh, delta is perhaps um, a probability that we are willing to have the algorithm fail on us. And that should be very, very small. Um, but the fact that we, we allow that uh, some small, um, not quite infinitesimal, but, but computationally very, very small probability of failure 
um, allows us a lot more flexibility in our algorithms. Um, so this is normally something like one over the size of the data set or, or 10 to the minus six chance that the algorithm might actually leak a little more information than we were willing to originally. Um, just as in a cryptographic setting, there might be a, you know, a probability that you can randomly guess a password or the probability that uh, you know, somebody can break an encryption key in five minutes with their computer. Um, it should be a very, very small, cryptographically small number. Okay. Um, the total budget is the, is the total amount of information we're willing to leak out of the data. And, and again, we normally judge that in terms of epsilon. And the reason why epsilons are important are if we make repeated differentially private routines and stitch them together by this, by this programmability uh, constraint, uh, composition is able to tell us, have I exceeded the amount of information I was willing to, 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 to leak? Have I, um, am I still making the, 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 the privacy guarantee that I was offering to Alice when she joined the data set um, or, or, or not, or, or should, I, should I stop uh, analyzing on the data set? That is, that is the end. Uh, thanks for your, for your patience getting these slides up and Jack for driving. That was really, really perfect. Thank you. That's fantastic. I think it was a great kind of intuitive sense of, of what differential privacy is about. And I think that kind of helps us segue a little bit too onto what the competition is all about, right? And as James said, that you know, the, the kind of leading kind of cutting edge in terms of um, private end-to-end -end systems is combining some of the input privacy and output privacy techniques to do meaningful things that often you may not be able to do otherwise. Um, so in the competition, as we'll cover in, in detail next week, we provide tools for you to actually leverage uh, differential privacy and secure enclaves to do what's called eyes off data science. So what, what, what is that? Well, imagine that uh, you have a very sensitive data set, a very sensitive, that is a sensitive data set, coming from one or maybe even two different parties that's being joined together inside of the confines of a secure enclave. So we know that the data is kept in there and safe. And now as a data scientist, your job is to access that enclave and use the, a set of tools, differential privacy tools, to ask questions, to learn about the relationship of inputs to outputs. Similar to a regular data science competition, you're trying to learn from the inputs to guess you know, a, a, a special column essentially from the data set. And as you do this, it becomes a strategy game because just like if you're playing a game of chess or something, you need to think through, well, what questions do I wanna ask? How much privacy budget, how much epsilon, as James described, is that gonna cost me? And also Delta, which I, I guess you'll see uh, next week as we go into it in more detail. What's that actually gonna cost me? And ultimately the scoring isn't just purely your accuracy and your ability to predict you know, the, the outcome of a certain event or the likelihood of, um, you know, the output of y given an x, but it's your accuracy less a function of essentially those epsilons and deltas that have gotten you there. So the game is really about efficiency. How do you use privacy budget in an intelligent uh, fashion, it, 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 you know, trying to minimize how much access you need to the underlying data to make the absolute best predictions you can possibly make. Um, and I think this is the first kind of large scale competition of this kind, but it's fundamentally important for NSOs, for groups like the UN, et cetera, as we have a range of different activities where we have different uh, sensitive data sets coming together in order to help us see some analysis. But at the same time, you need to make sure that there's a level of protection on the dissemination um, of the outputs that come from it. So the first, you know, kind of larger a pilot project that was done by the UN Pet Lab when it was first created was looking at international trade reconciliation. So in that case, different countries are uploading sensitive information about their imports and exports. And they're looking you know, internationally to see where recordings of one country are diverting a lot from another country. You could say, is trade really sensitive? Well, in many cases it can be because when you learn about certain classes of trade, you actually learn about how much goods and services are being imported by individuals and by individual companies within different countries and hence that becomes commercially sensitive or private to, to those individuals etc and um, so the question is is if we bring those data together in a secure environment can we ask and pose questions to it and learn about the relationships etc 
without ever directly seeing the data. Now, the data that's going to be used in the competition itself, we'll go into more detail. Um, we'll touch on it next week, and then it will actually be available during the competition itself. But it's brought to us um, by Federico's team, um, and it's very much real data um, that, that poses challenges around uh, the, the broader refugee, um, uh, one of the data sets associated with uh, refugees from around the world. So it's very much a real data set in a context that's fundamentally important to national statistics offices and groups like the UN. So hopefully it'll be a really interesting competition where everyone can learn a lot, not just in kind of a classroom environment where you, you know, you see the mathematical equations, but you don't really get a great feel for it, but in a very practical competitive sense where you can try different things out in a sandbox, come up with strategies and, and try to compete based on your understanding. And you can do a range of things, including um, some libraries from the Smart Noise group. So that's a collaboration between um, a number of parties, including Harvard and Microsoft, um, which allow you to make SQL-like queries that are differentially private. Um, synthetic data, so creating fake data that looks and hopefully holds a lot of the correlations associated with the underlying data set. But it in itself is actually differentially private, so you're not learning anything about individuals from the underlying data set. There's also OpenDP, which I believe James touched upon, which allows you to take transformations of the original data set and then measurements. Um, and there's a library that was built by uh, Nisha, who spoke earlier, called DiffRivLib, which is similar to sklearn if, you, if you're familiar with it, that allows you to train uh, decision trees and logistic regression, uh, perform PCA, et cetera, on sensitive data, again, by spending some of this epsilon and delta. Like you go into a shop, you have a privacy budget, you're spending it. Every spend reduces your score, but hopefully the information you gain increases your accuracy. And it's a, gain of, a game of balancing utility with um, essentially privacy, how much data you need to actually see. So I realize we're a bit over time um, because of some of the, the uh, technical logistics. But we can pop in and just see if there's any. Um, oh, <laughs> there are quite a few questions that came in during that. I couldn't see my screen. So um, why don't we take a, a few questions and any of the questions that aren't answered in the call, we can follow up as well in the the Discord, which is available on the the Pet Lab um, uh, competition website. So James, why don't we? The, the the last question that just came in was from Henry Wild and says, where do you stand on DP releases in the presence of vanilla re releases? Uh, releasing safe but not DP marginal tables from the same data set, for instance. I don't, I don't, I, uh, I, I'm not sure what, uh, what a vanilla or safe thing is. Um, it, it, you know, um, again, I, I would sort of harken back to this, this, this Fundamental information theoretic result of of dinner in a sim, which is which is lots of things that look incredibly innocuous. There is some attack that that will leak into individual level information. Um, and so, honestly, a lot of my day job is uh, programmers coming to me and saying, "Hey, look, this thing is an aggregate. It must be safe, right?" And 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 trying to explain that that you know. Um, off the back of my head, you know, here here's some attacks that uh, that that could be intention uh, could could not even be malicious, could be like perfectly naive queries uh, to try to learn a little bit more about the population, and suddenly you've learned Alice's data. Um, so so not to be too long winded, um, you know, k anonymity is really nothing more than a sort of a speed bump um, in terms of uh, or, uh, or privacy theater. Um, differential privacy is is. I, I hope that the literature expands. There are certainly lots of flavors of differential privacy that have so like slightly nuanced definitions about what neighboring data sets mean, what indistinguishability means. Um, but it's really the only framework we have that comes with a um, a strong gold standard uh, guarantee that uh, that if you release answers in this way um, and uh, that you're not going to reconstruct the underlying data in some way. So so that that would be my my stand would be. A, I don't know what vanilla means here, but uh, but vanilla, any any assurance? Don't trust me. This thing doesn't leak information. Scares scares me uh, incredibly. Yeah, I, I think that's well said. I, I think I think 
you know, at least how I try to think about it is something might seem safe, but you actually don't have guarantees unless you have a guarantee and that guarantee happens to be called differential privacy to some degree. That's the, yeah. And obviously this, the same is true also if you go to MPC land, um, you know, people talk about UC and AC composability of algorithms, trying to show that if you do one thing and then another thing, when they're combined, they're still secure, et cetera. Um, and I guess one of the, you know, people talk about post-quantum, a question came up previously, but differential privacy is really information theoretic secure because you're adding noise, you're destroying information. So it's not like some supercomputer in the future is going to be able to, um, unless it's a time machine, <laughs> um, it's going to be uh, able to, to yeah, um, undo what you've just done. Great, oh. so um, an, another question that, that um, oh, sorry. Okay, so someone has upvoted uh, Another question, if I can find it. <laughs> um, it's about differential privacy on inputs uh, into the data set. So there is a model right. of differential privacy, uh, sometimes called the local model, in which in, in the model that I explained, we trusted the curator to look at the raw data, um, compute the actual answer and add noise to it. Uh, that is, there's a trusted intermediary and that trusted intermediary might live, might be a, a multi-party comput uh, computation. It might be a secure enclave. It might be one of these other pets. There might be a setting in which you don't have uh, a, a trusted curator and and um, and and you're not willing to trust a, a pet for, for for various side channels. And so another approach is is to randomize at the point of collection. That is perhaps, you know, if you're doing a phone survey, randomize on the device uh, before, you know, as the data is being collected, add noise at that point. That's called the local model. Um, and we're beginning to better understand uh, what's possible to do under the local model. Um, it does come with a lot of limitations, like typically your data needs to be binarized. Um, and typically also if there's, um, if you're exploring something very complicated, like, you know, relationships between variables, there's a giant utility loss. Um, the amount of noise that you're going to end up adding in the local model um, dwarfs the amount of noise you have to add in the central model. But in some settings and some end to end solutions like that might be that might be the way you go forward. And so that's 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 definitely a, a solution. Uh, when, when I mentioned uh, industry level um, applications of DP, it's very, very common at that level. So, you know, if you're if you're Google scale and Apple scale and you can uh, you've got billions of users um, and you're looking for for for, you know, to try to understand uh, things in, in the underlying population. Uh, often you can afford that level of noise because you like the way it integrates with the rest of your 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 pets. Yeah, and I think there's a, a lot of work. Um, I mean, that's basically the entire topic of federated learning as well, which would be a big topic for Meta and Google because of Android and stuff. I did my uh, PhD in, in machine learning and I think it was in like 2016 or 2017. Suddenly at every NeurIPS, ICML, UAI, AI stats conference, there was suddenly talks about this because people were saying, oh God, we can improve our, you know, um, uh, predicting the next word when someone's texting or something or, or spotting typos that might have colloquial differences or something through these kind of methods. So it's, it is a really big, big topic of conversation in the broader community. Um, one thing I think that might be also worth just mentioning is that um, often people have talked about input and output privacy as if they are competing methods. But if you want to join two tables together, <laughs> you want it to be differentially private before you do that, you can't make that join, right? It, equally, if you're using some NPC uh, you know, computation or something like that, ultimately you're probably going to try to release something at some point. Um, and, and so a lot of the time these are more kind of complementary sets of techniques rather than actually competing. And then just depending on the use case, it's a question of what actually is fit for purpose in this particular scenario as opposed to a one thing is going to solve all problems. It was another question if I can find it around um, the use of, for example, medical data um, when precision med medicine is very important. And I, I guess that comes up a lot, you know, like, you know, is differential privacy that kind of a, can you solve everything with it? But, you know, probably there's limitations. So you know, sometimes you need a doctor to actually see a scan or, you know, maybe that there's more to that. But have you any comments on that, James? I, so I would say that this is, this is, this is a common reflex. Um, when you talk to anybody who's, using data for social good and solving important problems um you know that you're in the reason you're in that field is that you think you are getting important answers that will help society um and and so the, there is a reflex which is if i'm adding noise 
I'm getting less information. Uh, I can't help society quite as much. I can't, I can't. Uh, so uh, uh, just a couple of things to push back on. Um, you know, if you are in a setting where, where privacy is not an ethical imperative in your analysis, then, then maybe you are in a, in a, in a, in a slightly different world. Um, you know, I, I, I do think that, you know, in, in, in a lot of the important settings where we are trying to solve social problems with, with, with social data, we're talking about individual level behavior. We're talking about extremely sensitive traits. Um, if we don't think of privacy as part of the calculus of, of what it means to do good data science, uh, then we're going to start losing subjects. We're going to start losing faith in science. We're going to start losing uh, the ability, you know, the, the trust of individuals to share their data or the trust of, of um, um, industry and, and government institutions to share that data with researchers. Uh, so, so, you know, I think I think um, I think there is there's this concept of a privacy utility trade off that is it's important to get a good answer it's important to get a private answer um, and 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 in different settings we might make different balances between privacy and utility but i think there's very very few settings in which we're, we're dealing with sensitive user level information and we don't care at all about privacy um, I, and i would also just add again um, you try to reiterate this idea that when we add noise for differential privacy, we're often adding a very, very small amount of noise. And there are lots of other forms of noise in our analyses. We don't quite know what the model is. We have a finite sample. There's measurement error. Um, and so this is differential privacy is is, you know, looks very, you know, suspect because it's it's the one form of it's the one form of noise in our analysis that we're self-inflicting, and we know exactly what the mathematical properties are. And these other things we have to sort of guess about, so we often just sort of ignore them, shoo them away. Um, but on the other hand, it's the form of noise that's easiest to correct because we know exactly what the noise distribution was, we know what the theory was, we know why we added it, we know how to deal with it on the other end. Um, so again, uh, if you really care about noise in your data, go get more data. Um, uh, as opposed to, um, you know, go, go get more, um, you know, worry about uh, about privacy is, is sort of my would be my general rule. Um, but 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 I but I but I do understand like the uh, when we're used to teasing out every last possible result in the answer, um, then, uh, then then this is an issue. And maybe just the last question I think we can answer before we all put more questions on Discord as they as they came up was just um, uh, it was a question like, you know, what are we trying to anonymize or something that came up earlier from Fini, I believe it was, um, in the questions during the competition. And actually, the goal of the competition is you can actually be quite um, aggressive to get as much information out as you possibly can. Um, you're using these libraries and frameworks in a very trusted and safe environment. So hopefully you shouldn't actually be able to get out anything more than um, what your epsilon and your deltas have, have kind of encapsulated. And so your real goal is to make absolute, you, know, you just spoke about a second ago, this trade off between utility and privacy. You want to get as much utility as you possibly can. Um, but, you know, you want to not spend too much of your privacy budget so that you can you know, maximize your position in the scoreboard and hopefully I don't know, win the competition. So I think at this point uh, we'll, we'll wrap up. Obviously, we went over. Thank you so much for so many people staying on the call right to the very end. Um, the Discord channel is up and there's lots of people on it now, so um, we can move questions over to there and, and hopefully answer anything that comes up over the coming weeks. This time next week, you're going to actually see the libraries involved, the tools, how you use them, the Jupyter notebooks, etc. Um, and you'll get kind of familiar with what to actually expect, even the scoring mechanisms, etc. But hopefully we've laid a good context for the setting and the kind of underlying um, foundational concepts. That, that stand behind the competition themselves. So thank you everyone, and we will see you next week.